Thanks, Ineza. Um, I'm just going to give a, a brief uh, introduction to loss and damage. Um, and it's just an overview of kind of some of the work that we've been doing and, and in general, the, the topic itself. Um, so when we're talking about loss and damage, we're talking about the costs of climate change that are not avoided through mitigation and adaptation. So really looking at those more um, severe um, and extreme uh, climate impacts, weather events um, that are already happening and are, are gonna get worse in the future. So um, when we're talking about loss, um, we're talking about things that are irreplaceable. So the loss of health, uh, loss of lives, um, people's livelihoods, their culture and ecosystems. And when we talk about damage, we're talking about um, replaceable damage, um, such as infrastructure and property, um, schools, hospitals, roads, um, houses um, that are damaged due to climate change, um, but uh, can essentially be rebuilt. So um, loss and damage can be immediate, uh, such as uh, cyclones, um, wildfires, uh, or glacial burst floods. Um, and we've seen lots of examples of these in recent years. Um, uh, we also have slow onset loss and damage, which um, is uh, essentially events that occur over a longer period of time, such as desertification, ocean acidification, there's a picture of the Great Barrier Reef, uh, and sea level rise, which is um, having big effects in the Pacific Islands. So one example of loss and damage were the um, twin cyclones in Mozambique in 2019 that happened within one month of each other. And um, there was uh, an enormous amount of damage. Um, uh, there were, uh, I think, 2 million people affected. Um, uh, hundreds of thousands of people were displaced and uh, some of those people remain displaced today. Um, and Mozambique didn't receive the support that it needed to recover from the cyclones, um, some of the strongest it's ever seen. And um, its uh, economy and society remain um, challenged by the, uh, by the climate impact they faced two years ago. And, and some of those people um, who were displaced by the cyclones um, are still living in camps for displaced people. Um, and so, yeah, um, looking at how loss and damage is dealt with on the ground, um, most of it is through humanitarian uh, aid and support, as well as response by governments um, in terms of like, so there's a photo here of the Red Cross and Red Crescent, actually in Mozambique. Um, they would deliver food, shelter, supplies to people. Um, and they would, uh, they would help support communities in the ways they need. Um, uh, and loss and damage can also, it is also currently dealt with to some extent through adaptation projects. For example, through um, developing early warning systems um, to help form people of, of oncoming disasters. Um, and, uh, uh, but um, generally this kind of disaster risk reduction and humanitarian sector uh, and adaptation um, is simply not sufficient to deal with the increasing scale of, of how loss and damage is affecting people around the world. Um, and that's why I often say loss and damage Um, and the reason for that is that that loss and damage um, is already occurring and will continue to occur um, at a great scale. Um, and yet um, the decision makers that are um, making policy around this are um, not accountable to people who are most affected by loss and damage from climate change. And uh, the majority uh, of people who did the least to cause 
climate change are, are the ones who are dealing with the effects of climate change. Um, and I say you've never heard of it. Well, you might have heard of it as climate change professionals, um, but um, I think that in general, the public doesn't have a really good understanding of, um, of loss and damage. Um, there are a lot of misconceptions about it and, um, and also just the, the policy around it. I don't think people kind of connect the pieces um, in terms of like, what's the responsibility of countries that have historically um, contributed a lot to pollution and, and have benefited from that and have also benefited from um, colonizing these same countries that are being really strongly affected by climate impacts. Um, so within the UN climate negotiations, um, loss and damage is dealt with through the Warsaw International Mechanism on Loss and Damage, which has a mandate to address loss and damage associated with the impacts of climate change, enhance knowledge, strengthen dialogue, and enhance action and support, including through finance, technology, and capacity building. Uh, loss and damage is also part of the Paris Agreement as Article 8, um, and is seen by many as the third pillar of the Paris Agreement after, um, I'm sorry, in conjunction with mitigation and adaptation um, as the next step on that spectrum of, um, of dealing with climate uh, impacts. In terms of finance for paying for loss and damage, the estimated cost of loss and damage in 2020 was between 100 and 400 billion US dollars. Um, some estimates um, around loss and damage, it is, it is challenging to measure, but by 2030, they estimate that um, the cost will be um, between 300 and um, 600 billion dollars per year. Um, and that by 2050, this cost could reach one to two trillion dollars per year. Um, and in terms of what finance is available for loss and damage, the designated funds from uh, the International Climate Framework are zero dollars for loss and damage. Um, that being said, some funding uh, for adaptation uh, and humanitarian sector does go to, toward loss and damage on the ground, of course, because we do send these responses in. Um, but I think the point that I'm trying to make is that uh, while loss and damage is the third pillar of the Paris Agreement, um, it's not respected as such um, with regard to how developed countries are providing um, climate finance, um, especially we've seen the goal uh, for climate finance for governments to provide $100 billion per year by 2020, that countries are not have not really met this goal. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, basically we've been pushing um, for countries to establish a new um, a stream of finance for loss and damage. Um, and that, that dovetails into what we hope to see at COP26. Um, so as we mentioned, we've been pushing for governments to establish a new window of finance on loss and damage under the UNFCCC. Um, and a lot of developing countries have been asking for the same, um, but developed countries have not been listening to their calls for increased finance and support. Um, we uh, also acknowledge that the Santiago Network for Loss and Damage, which is uh, a new network that will be focusing on delivering technical support to countries on the ground so they can address loss and damage, is um, set for being established uh, or operationalized at COP26. And we hope to see a Santiago network that is fit for purpose in terms of meeting the needs of countries um, on the ground uh, in terms of how they address loss and damage. In terms of a general vision for the future, um, I think Generally, we hope that um, countries work together and implement um, ambitious mitigation and adaptation plans. But we do want to see compensation to the victims um, uh, of climate disasters and reparation to people um, who were wronged by the injustices of 
uh, big polluting countries that refuse to provide support for loss and damage. And ultimately, we want accountability for, um, from big polluters, even both governments and um, the biggest polluting companies, such as uh, fossil fuel companies. In terms of what we're doing at LDYC, the Loss and Damage Youth Coalition, we're telling stories about how loss and damage affects people from around the world. We're conducting advocacy to um, global leaders uh, on how they can take action on loss and damage. Um, for example, we've written open letters to the UK and US governments and recently met with the COP26 president, Alok Sharma. Um, and we are training a new generation of youth leaders um, to be calling for justice on loss and damage. And our demands, um, which are ever evolving, sorry, I just dropped my pen, um, are to prioritize action on loss and damage, make it a political priority, to provide a new finance facility for loss and damage under the UNFCCC, to pledge finance, new and additional finance for that facility, to make loss and damage decision making inclusive for all stakeholders, uh, especially those who are uh, most affected by uh, the impacts of climate change, and to meet with youth leaders such as LDYC um, to discuss how youth can be more involved in the process. Um, and I think that is it for my presentation, and I am going to pass it back um, to Inessa. Thank you so much, Sadie, for the presentation. I think uh, we now have a more clear idea of what is the loss and damage policy and how it's been, and what is the hope that we want to see in the future. Uh, so on this note, allow me to introduce our youth speaker who are going to share their experience on how uh, loss and damage interfere with their daily life. Our first speaker is uh, Curver from Trinidad and Tobago. She's going to tell us how she, uh, her life interfere with the loss and damage. Curver, uh, the floor is yours. So a few years ago, I used to enjoy the rain during our rainy season, which is right now from June to November. But unfortunately, now that I am um, pursuing a career in disaster risk management, I am stressed when it rains because I constantly think of all the people who are possibly being flooded if it rains too long or too much. And I think this highlights the psychosocial aspect of loss and damage due to climate change. Here in Trinidad and Tobago, intense irregular rain events can hurt agriculture by damaging crops and the flooding of fluid fuels the political tensions. And above average temperatures and increasing desertification affects respiratory patients like those who suffer from asthma, which is exacerbated in the pandemic because we receive Saharan dust from the African continent. So as that gets worse, it's going to affect the region in the Caribbean. And while my country does not experience the hurricanes, or my island doesn't experience the hurricanes as the more Northern islands, like even Tobago, which is another island that forms parts of my country, and being slightly more north in latitude, they experience more severe hurricanes than we do in Trinidad. And other islands like Grenada, where they also experienced Hurricane Ivan in 2004, which de decimated their internationally renowned agriculture industry, such as nutmeg, and also their tourism-based economy, which, is common in the Caribbean owing to the colonial history. And my island having a stronger economy tends to cover the disaster response. And Tobago having relying on tourism 
It's devastating when the coral reefs are experiencing bleaching or damaged by hurricanes and fishery folks have to expose themselves to venture out to sea only to yield less abundant catches. And other islands in the Caribbean have similar experiences. Recently known would be Hurricane Maria that devastated Dominica in 2017 and Hurricane Dorian that devastated the Bahamas in 2019. And these stories illustrate the pressing concern of climate change here in the Caribbean and the loss and damage that results from the psychosocial effect of having to migrate and illustrates the urgent need for loss and damage finance under the UNFCCC. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kepra, for your story. Um, so um, now allow me to invite our second speaker, um, Kevin from Kenya. Kevin, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Sorry, I can't turn on my video because I have a, a network problem. So when I turn on my video, I think it will interfere with the, the way I'm talking because you are experiencing a lot of rainfall where I am. So it is interfering with the network, yeah. So yeah, here in, here in, in Kenya, in, in East Africa, I think uh, in 2020, most of the people, I think you are out of this, uh, there's such some block as you see. And uh, me knowing this, I think uh, I, I was able to experience this, I think through movie, when I was watching the movie of uh, Moses, that is a biblical history. So during that time, I, the, the time I, I saw Locust on the video, but 2020, in the beginning of 2020, I think was my first time to see this uh, swamp of uh, desert Locust, which it, they were migrating from the other part of Somalia. And um, and this one that the raising of number of these desert locusts present can extremely alarm threaten to food security and also livestock in East Africa. So, and uh, most of the people were asking, I think also the scientists say, how can you maybe relate uh, locusts with climate change, knowing that this was the major problem which we will experience in 2020, most of the East Africa country, uh, that is Ethiopia, Uganda, Somalia, and Kenya, mostly in Kenya, because these locusts destroy a lot of plantation. And um, during that, I think in our geography, we were able to know as there was this in, uh, term known as Indian Ocean Dipolar, uh, which was also known as Indian Nino. So this is, is an irregular oscillation of sea surface temperature in which climate system that affect weather from East Africa up to the other part of uh, Western Australia. So this, this was the one which um, I think bring a lot of locusts because most of these locusts were breeding in the other part of Somalia. And that uh, Indian Ocean Dipolar was uh, moving to other part of Somalia, which bring uh, the best breeding site for this uh, locust invasion. So this is how we can relate climate change and uh, locust invasion, knowing that um, and knowing that uh, this locust invasion was also due to also raising or uh, raise of uh, temperature in Indian Ocean, knowing that Indian Ocean, how is this temperature raised is due to melting of ice in Arctic and also in Antarctic. So when this ice melt usually increase the body mass of the water in, in this Indian Ocean and also other ocean in Africa. So that is the way it led to this uh, locust invasion and they think it was really uh, because it was scare most of the food security in Kenya in the other part especially this uh, locusts were migrating from the desert region to the green to mostly to the island region here in Kenya and also yeah in Kenya mostly in Rift Valley and other parts and it destroy a lot of plantation not only destroy at all also it interfere with most of the people's ecology because most of these people were planting a large or a large hectares of farm 
depending on that in food security and also to pay for for their children fees and as for the Kenya economy so when these loggers just land in a small like maybe in an actor within the second I think that when you go to visit that land is just plain just just eat everything you see so this is how most of the locust uh, most in east africa and also other part of the because i also saw that we also locust was also invade in other part of asia that is india and other parts so this is how this locust interfere and also destroy large plantation here in kenya yeah thank you very much it's just a so short and brief thank you so much for, for sharing even I think um, I'm few of the people who do not know how to link locust and climate change, but now I think I do have an understanding on that one. So very thank you so much. Uh, allow me to invite our third speaker, uh, Farhana. Farhana, uh, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Can you all hear me? Uh, yes. Okay. All right, thanks, Anita. Um, Malaysia is my home. Its subtropical climate, sunny rays, and high rises among lush greenery are as familiar to me as my name. Small changes in the environment throughout the years have accumulated to large climate impacts and make me fear for a future if significant climate action is continually ignored. Like many former colonial countries, the balance between economic development and environmental sustainability is tilted in the former because economic superiority is favored globally. And this has resulted in increasingly severe climate impacts. Loss and damage come in many forms, sometimes obvious, other times not. Usually loss and damage can be easily expressed as cause of damages as a direct result of climate impact. So in Malaysia back in 2014, the expected monsoon season turned torrential and the heavy rainfall caused a devastating flood. The state of Kelantan was severely affected, and this affected um, the northern and eastern parts of Malaysia. By the end of the storm, the estimated cost of damages was around 1 billion ringgit, or equivalent to 300 million US dollars. Though costly, the costs to well-being and the quality of life were more. The flood left behind contaminated water, rubbish, and carcasses, which lent to the foul old odor that permeated the air. The situation was made worse with no electricity and no clean drinking water. This form of loss and damage is direct and immediate and would appropriately highlight loss and damage. However, an indirect and future loss of that loss and damage must also be highlighted. And this can be seen in um, another situation. In Gunung Kantan, in the state of Perak, is a historical limestone mountain. It is a national and spiritual heritage site and houses a diverse ecosystem. Gunung Kantan is poised for exploitation of its natural resources, but a greater cost because there is no price to history and culture. If there is a cost to that, it is under-evaluated. So non-economic losses are not as prominent as economic losses because it is difficult to quantify. Therefore, we share our stories to share with you the true cost of loss and damage due to both natural and man-made climate impacts. Hence, the need for climate adaptation and mitigation measures, which ultimately require financing. As a youth in a country of the global south, I see the need for climate responsibility by my own country and neighboring countries, especially those in the global north who have and continue to benefit from our resources. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fahana, for sharing. And uh, thank for everyone, I mean, for, the, for our speakers, because you, you brought to us like a lived experience of how loss and damage is being, um, is being interfering with our life and also from different perspective, different location. So we get to understand that the loss and damage is something that is happening everywhere. Uh, so um, before, um, I think we're going to go in a small, um, in a breakout room session, small group, where we're going to discuss ourselves um, about how, um, how do we see loss and damage impact in our daily life. So on that note, let me invite my colleague, um, Jeff, so that he can uh, introduce us to um, the breakout room session. Thanks. Jeff, the floor is yours. 
All right. Um, hi again, everyone. I am Jeff. And for the um, next um, part of the session, we are now going to have the breakout session. So um, will Aziz will put us to another room? Uh, I'll do it. <laughs> I think Aziz has had no right. problems. All right. So while um, CD is putting us into the breakout room, um, what are uh, the, 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 the thing that we are going to do is we are just going to um, discuss how LD or loss and damage affects our country and how can the youth be involved in decision making regarding with the LDYC and into the um, process of championing loss and damage. Um, specifically in in um, attaining our goal to really have the the justice for the things that um, mentioned by our speakers earlier. So yeah. Great. So yeah, I'll I'll be putting you into the into just two groups. Um, and the the question the first question is um is how does loss and damage affect your country and community? And I'll open the rooms, you have some time. All right, I think everyone is already here. So again, uh, everyone welcome to the plenary. Uh, so we just finished the uh, our first breakout session. So I'm gonna report about the, the, um, the, the our inputs um, from our session. So basically, we just talk about how you know from the question itself that we uh, that we just discussed um, how the loss and damage affect our countries and how can we how can we be involved in this um, fight for loss and damage. So basically, what we just discussed in our group, um, some of us um, you know uh, uh, mentioned that uh, that they love rains, but um, as as time goes by, these rains become more and more wild, and um, uh, it's becoming dangerous. That it that it costs lives, and it's not you know normal for 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 us because we we love rain. We know that rain um, waters uh, the the ecosystem itself, etc. It it has a lot of benefits, but then. It, for for other countries, rains uh, uh, bring um, catastrophes, and um, also uh, one of one of the people inside the session discussed that um, uh, they are trying to uh, encourage the government to do more about uh, what is going on into their country, which is the the coastal erosion because of the sea level rise, and um, it's also good that. Um, that she, she mentioned that um, that uh, although the that her country is being um, being uh, affected by by climate change by the climate crisis, it's not an excuse because um, uh, other countries are also being affected, but in a larger scale. And others also mentioned that. Um, uh, the 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 cost uh, the cost of um, development of progress uh, by nations because as you all know most of the raw uh, most of the raw and um, uh, resources uh, to to make things are coming from the global south but it's the it's the countries who are doing this um, are they they are the one who are being developed uh, they are the one who are progressing. And those countries who, uh, uh, who this or where this um, raw materials are coming from, they are being left behind, and not just about development, but also how to handle man uh, disasters and uh, post disaster um, um, aids. And I think it's really good to know these things because we can see that we are all affected by by the loss and damage brought by the climate change but it's different from uh, from uh, from it's different because we have different um, uh, contexts uh, we have different languages we have uh, different um, 
take on how to do these things or how to uh, perceive this issue. So I think that's a great reminder that um, we are all affected, but at the same time, we are not the same or we, we don't have the same contribution to the problem. That's it. I'll pass it to CD. Sure. Um, yeah, so I guess in our breakout group, um, I think there was a lot of similarity in terms of like, um, I think there's examples really in every country of how loss and damage um, is, is having an impact um, from, you know, communities in the Arctic or in, in Alaska that are, um, have melting sea ice and that's leading um, to coastal erosion as well as sea level rise. Um, and communities are thinking about relocation to Nepal where um, from the monsoon season, like intense storms are, um, are causing hundreds of deaths each year. Um, and then there's challenges with response times from the government and, um, and also just building effective systems. Um, and yeah, so, um, and, and I think there's lots of great examples that came up in our, in our group. Um, I think I, I wanted to transition to our next, um, activity. Um, basically we're going to be having another breakout, um, but this one is going to be focused more on strategy. Um, so basically like what, what should the climate movement do? What overall needs to be done um, to, to take action on loss and damage? So there are three questions. One is, what should the climate movement do to make action on loss and damage a central priority for decision makers? What would action on loss and damage look like in your country or community? And drawing upon your own networks and spheres of influence, how can you contribute to driving action on loss and damage? And there is, we've, made a jam board for this. Um, as you I don't know if you can drop the link um, to the jam boards. And um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to send you back into the breakouts. Um, so basically um, room one, which is the one that um, Ineza um, and I were in um, is going to be working on um, the first two, the, the first slides of the Jamboard. Um, and the, there'll be three different slides. And then room two will be working on the next three. Um, so slides four, five, and six. Um, and feel free to take stickies from the left side and directly put them onto the Jamboard as well as, as, well as having your discussion. Um, so please make sure that you have the link to the Jamboard open and um, we'll send you into the groups. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for uh, a great discussion. Um, we don't really have so much time left, um, but if I can invite um, someone from breakout room two, so the one that I wasn't in, to um, share some highlights. Um, yeah, so someone who wants to share just a few interesting things that they've seen. I will nominate Sandra <laughs> from our breakout room. Go, Sandra. Uh, <laughs> Jeff, 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 Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Just share whatever you want to share. Well, uh, from our breakout session, uh, one thing I can share with you is that uh, uh, the youth should be involved. Like uh, we don't need uh, uh, we don't need just to leave that to the government or the other other people. So we need to involve the youth. Also, we need to involve like the local community. Also, involve uh, people with the with no knowledge. Just share our knowledge so that we can all take action and do something about the loss and damage. Thanks. Thanks so much, Sandra. Um, and I 
we had a really interesting discussion in, in our group and I really encourage um, people to take a look at all of the different slides in the Jamboard um, to see kind of the ideas that people have come up with. Um, but I'm actually going to, to end the session there um, just with respect to your guys' time. And um, I want to thank everyone um, so much for coming out today. It was, I, I felt it was a really fruitful discussion in both of the breakout rooms. Um, and um, yeah, I wish you guys all the best and, and please um, feel free to contact us if you uh, have any questions uh, about the Lost and Image Youth Coalition and our work. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.